Hello, folks, and welcome to lunchtime lectures. Hopefully, someone's out there, uh, and for we are live. Um, I'm Derek Pratt, educator here at the Erie Canal Museum. Miss me? It's been a while, uh, frankly, since the last time I think we've been live on Facebook here. Um, well, thanks for joining us today for this uh, special lecture. We were supposed to have, uh, hey, we got someone in the in the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, by the way, folks, if you'd like to join the Zoom uh, discussion, um, especially for the Q&A at the end, um, we encourage you. Um, there's a link in the description to this video. You can sign up uh, for a, a $5 donation to the museum. You can sign up for that. And also, if you're watching on Facebook Live, we also encourage, uh, if you can, a donation. Uh, these are hard, strange times we live in uh, here in 2020, so any help here uh, is much appreciated. Um, that said, uh, we really appreciate our guests joining us today. Uh, Dr. Adam Lotz uh, from Binghamton University. He was actually supposed to speak with us in, what was it, late March, I believe? Something like that, yep. Yep. Uh, in case you folks missed it, uh, a global yeah. pandemic struck, uh, which kind of screwed up those plans. Um, so, but we're, we're glad to have him here today. Uh, and I think now um, the topic's even more relevant. It, it was in March as we as we talk about new forms of school reform and uh, and whatnot uh, in these interesting times. Um, so we will be talking about uh, Joseph Lancaster, an educational reformer who was a contemporary of the Canal. Uh, we often think about the Erie Canal in terms of reform a lot, um, especially the the big ones that. Uh, we all know about and really celebrate today uh, abolition, women's rights, and everything. But there were other uh, equally almost as important um, reform movements like that in education. Um, and uh, Adam's here to talk to us about one of them. So I'll give it over to you. All right, great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Derek. Um, and uh, thanks, everybody, for sharing your lunch hour. Um, as, as Derek says, I, I've been spending a lot of my time now in the archives working on the, the story of uh, Joseph Lancaster uh, around the first 30 uh, years of the 1800s. And I can't help, uh, but, and he, uh, as we'll be talking about this afternoon, he sort of was the face of this uh, worldwide uh, ed education reform movement 200 years ago. And as I've been in the archives, <laughs> it hasn't, it hasn't been, I haven't been able to escape the parallels between this plan that people came up with in 1820 that clearly wouldn't, wasn't going to work, but they had to do it, so they tried it, and what all of our kids in K-12 schools are suddenly doing in 2020, which, you know, um, no one I don't think would say it's the perfect plan, uh, but people are trying all kinds of new things now, so it does seem painfully um, reminiscent sometimes of the same stories 200 years ago. But uh, uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is share uh, the twin stories of Joseph Lancaster, the person, and the, the school movement that, that bore his name and took off after him. And um, just for a little background, I'm, this is what I'm working on right now. It's a book that I'm, I'm just starting to draft the outline on. So I'm up to my eyeballs in archival stuff, um, stuff from New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, London. Um, and I'd like to uh, share with you both stories and the way they're connected. The person, Joseph Lancaster's life story and the way that without his um, unique and sort of tragic life story, American public schools, at least at that 200 years ago, would look totally different. So, but let's start with Lancaster himself because I know for um, non-experts, um, the name has mostly been lost uh, to, to, uh, to most of us Americans. Uh, unlike Horace Mann, who I, I looked, like, apparently Syracuse doesn't have a Horace Mann school, but uh, Binghamton sure does, and they're scattered around the country. And Horace Mann gets this credit as the sort of uh, father of American public education. And um, 
as I'm going to try to argue, man gets too much credit that way. Uh, Lancaster really should be the person that people think of if they think of one person as the, per the one that started public education. Uh, it's certainly far more um, uh, Lancaster than Horace Mann. But that's the story we'll get to this lunch. First, the story of Lancaster himself, because it has mostly been lost to, to most of us. Um, I'd like to share uh, 20 years, especially, and I'll, I'll um, give you some of the, the graphics. Um, 20 years, 1818 to 1838. Um, and in that year, it went from, from top of the world to the bottom. In 1818, Joseph Lancaster arrived in New York City, and he was um, had been invited, especially by the mayor, uh, uh, and he had been, he was welcomed as the sort of savior of the city. The mayor, by the way, uh, as Derek mentioned, it, it, there is an Erie Canal connection. The mayor, um, had, had, well, the, the person who invited him when he was mayor was DeWitt Clinton, who later went on to be governor, and of course was a, a huge backer of the Erie Canal. And DeWitt Clinton certainly thought that when especially chartered cruise ship up to Albany. Uh, and when DeWitt Clinton embraced Joseph Lancaster in 1818, uh, there's no doubt that Clinton saw Lancaster as the school version, the urban version of the Erie Canal. Uh, not that he would, you know, transport freight. I mean, that the Lancastrian system, Clinton thought, was going to transform America's cities like New York and make uh, uh, this dramatic revolution. As dramatic in cities, as the Erie Canal made in things like shipping. So in 1818, Lancaster arrives in New York. He's, he meets the governor. He gives a speech in front of Congress. Um, he shakes hands with the president. And at the same time, his ideas were made law in Philadelphia and soon in Baltimore. So in 1818, Lancaster shows up in the United States and he's the guy, he's the man. He's um, seen as this savior. But just 20 years later, 1838, Lancaster is dead. Uh, and his death is, um, is an ugly one. His head was crushed under the wheels of a horse carriage in New York City. Uh, and you never know uh, from the archives. I can't tell why exactly. But he's certain in 1838 was uh, plagued by depression. He had uh, been running from city to city for 20 years, from New York to Philadelphia, all the way to Caracas and Montreal. Um, his plans that had been made law in 1818 were now mostly discarded and often mocked. Uh, he was accused of financial misappropriation, even sexual abuse. So one of the stories is this uh, meteoric rise and then sudden crash. And as I said, not a lot of people remember Lancaster now, but this is one of his um, uh, obituaries. And as they put it in 1838, few men have attained more celebrity than Lancaster did, but his latter days were clouded by misfortune. And that's certainly true. Um, but if we want to understand, wait a second, let me come back, there we go. Uh, in order to understand this, we got to step back a few decades and try to get into the heads of America's urban elites at the, the early start of the 1800s. And of course, it's a very diverse group, even if you just take elite urban reformers. But one thing that a lot of them shared was this fear that life in cities would be dangerous for Republican American virtue. It wouldn't make citizens, give, give citizens the the um, disinterested public spirit they needed to keep America afloat as a republic. Um, and so to give you just one example, this is a speech uh, from a speech back in 1809 when DeWitt Clinton was mayor of New York. And he was speaking to a group of philanthropists uh, in New York City. Um, and he's, as he put it, uh, whoops, there we go. Uh, a number of benevolent persons had seen with concern the increasing vices of the city, arising in a great degree from the neglected education of the poor. Great cities are at all times the nurseries and hotbeds of crime. Now, um, one thing we need to take issue with, with the actual words of Clinton, yes, he's capturing the mood of a lot of elite uh, reformers and philanthropists at the time, but in general, even though Clinton said that they were worried about the neglected education of the poor, uh, with, um, from the archival version uh, uh, perspective, 200 years in the future perspective, 
it's clear that they didn't worry so much that poor people, low income people weren't getting educated. They worried that they were getting educated the wrong way. So uh, for example, let me share another slice from the archives. This was from a book, um, 1810, called The Cries of Philadelphia. And this was a series at the time. The Cries of Philadelphia was a straight ripoff from an earlier book called Cries of New York, which was a ripoff of a book called Cries of London. And the idea was these were little, uh, cheap little um, books you could buy that would take you on a tour of these exciting cities. And the, 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 the conceit was you'd have, um, you know, the cries, the, you'd hear what, what was going on in the city streets. And one of the cries of the city streets was this match girl. And this is, a, I'm sorry for the, the poor quality of the, of the image. This is from the uh, American Antiquarian Society collection in Worcester, Massachusetts. But the story that the book tells of the match girl is unmistakable. You can see that she's uh, depicted as, um, you know, dressed in rags, no, a barefoot, walking on the street, asking if anyone would buy matches. And the implication in the book from 1812, they don't come flat out and say it, uh, but they imply that because she can't make enough money selling matches, she's gonna, the word they use is vice. Um, and the, you know, what they meant by that was that girls would turn to prostitution, boys would turn to thievery and murder and, and things like that. So around you know, the first few decades of the 1800s, this feeling among urban elites was really um, palpable. Uh, this idea that the young people were learning, not nothing, but they were learning to be criminals. They weren't learning to be citizens. They weren't learning to read or write or get, get a, a legal job. Uh, and so there was this desperation that in order for America to flourish, in, more, in order for a republic to survive, children had to learn a new way. And they didn't know what to do. There were lots of schools in America's cities at the time. There were mostly um, pay schools. You know, you would pay some tuition to a, uh, an entrepreneur who would teach your students. Uh, and depending on how much money you had, they could go, you know, all the way through college, obviously, from a very early time. Um, so it wasn't that there weren't schools, it's that there weren't schools, weren't enough schools that you could go to if you didn't pay tuition. Some churches ran schools in cities, but they didn't cover enough uh, of the population. So America's urban elites were desperate for a solution. And it's this desperation that leads them to invite Joseph Lancaster in 1818 and to welcome him so wholeheartedly when he shows up. Because at the time, uh, Joseph Lancaster had built for 20 years a reputation in London as uh, a, a revolutionary thinker when it comes to ur uh, educating urban elites. Um, and no one, of course, uh, promoted this myth more than Lancaster himself. He was not a, a nice person. He was a, a, a shameless self-promoter, as, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, but starting in 1798, Joseph Lancaster was teaching school. He was 23 years old teaching school in his father's house, and he started um, taking donations so that some of the kids in the neighborhood who couldn't afford it could attend his school for free. And the way I think about this, it's sort of a 1798 version of um, getting Zuckerberg. What happened to Joseph Lancaster, he's 23 years old, the Duke of Bedford visits his school. And the Duke of Bedford is, he's a Duke. He's, uh, you know, he's a royal family. He likes what he sees. He likes what Lancaster is doing. And he um, gives Lancaster a lot of money. And more than that, he puts Lancaster's name on the sort of short list for, for the rich and well-to-do in London at the time. So um, other royals endorse him. Lancaster gets to meet the king. Lancaster gets to call his school the Royal Borough Road School. And it all went, as you can imagine, it went straight to his head. So Lancaster, as a young man, has this sudden like uh, elevation into people saying that he has solved the problem of urban, urban poverty by providing this kind of low cost education to the poor kids in London. And so what I'd like to do is walk you through a little bit of this, of this Lancasterian reform. It's pretty simple. 
but it, um, it's promoted as if it's this revolution in the way that uh, cities can organize themselves. So the main, uh, the main um, uh, promise of the Lancastrian system was in teaching. So traditionally in cities, uh, in the Anglo-American world, the way schools worked is you'd have a, a teacher, usually called a master at the time, and the, the teacher would take 10 or 12 tuition paying students, as many as you know, he could, he or she, uh, there were a lot of women run schools as well, um, as many as they could sort of uh, manage. What Lancaster did was he farmed out the teaching instead of just one paid adult teacher, he would have one paid adult teacher and then uh, you know, some unknown number of unpaid child teachers. So the child teachers, he called monitors. And so here you have an image from his first edition uh, London uh, manual. Uh, Lancaster published a manual of his system. And so here you see the, the slightly older child, the monitor, teaching the slightly younger children how to read using slates and, and chalk. Um, and in this, this is the London edition, their little slate say, you can't see it, but it says, God save the king. And on the, the New York edition, which came out soon after, that just was, they just had a letter D on the slates because you know it was the United States, they didn't want to save the king anymore. Uh, but this is the crux of the Lancasterian reform. Instead of expensive teachers for small numbers of kids, you'd have free monitors for all the kids. Pay one teacher, the promise went, and you can get a thousand kids learning to write. Uh, and oh, they'd also learn to read. Uh, another image from um, the London edition of his early manual. This one's from the Library Company of Philadelphia. But the way they'd learn to read, the, they would toe the line, the phrase went. They put their toes on the circular, semicircular line, hands behind the back, and the monitor would teach them, instead of expensive books, they would make these reading placards put up on special reading sticks, as we'll see in a minute. And then all the kids could learn to read, they'd learn to write, they'd learn to, you know, uh, show up on time and wash their faces and all those things. And it wouldn't cost much of anything because the idea went, all the teachers would work for free. So uh, that, that was the biggest part of it. Lancaster also loved to talk about like things like architecture. This is a, a letter written to uh, Lancaster in 1813 when a correspondent is saying, here's what we've got for a building. You know, could we make a Lancasterian school here? The, the school rooms were supposed to look not like a school that way you were used to them, but one big school room. And you'd see the, the teacher's desk would be at one side. Um, you'd have the reading circles set up along the aisles. And then you'd have a, a raising floor sloping up like an auditorium with the least advanced kids sitting in front and then going up to the most advanced in back. So this teacher could see everyone and everyone could see the teacher. Um, and, you know, and so instead of, you'd have this, these big open buildings to, to teach in. And Lancaster loved to make up machines to do the work. So this is from his notebook, which is also in um, Worcester, Massachusetts at the American Antiquarian Society. Lancaster's, his notebooks are full of this kind of stuff. These are some of his sketches of reading sticks. So instead of buying expensive books, you blow up the um, text into big placards that all the kids can read together. And, and the manuals that he published are just full of these uh, supposed solutions. The, the movable stand so that uh, you could have letters with different sin signals to the kids in the back, the alphabet wheel, that the kids could learn by, to read. And then this is one of my personal favorites. Lancaster was really obsessed with um, you know, time management, getting the kids not just to do all the same stuff at the same time, but cutting out any wasting of time. So you know the, the uh, ideas like Taylorism, people talk about them coming at the end of the 1800s. But really, they were just as popular at the beginning of the 1800s with uh, people like Lancaster. The holes for hats, all it was, was that Lancaster wrote that kids were wasting so much time hanging up their hats and then fighting about whose hat was who, which. So he said, and he claimed this as like a world-changing invention that he invented. Put a bench with holes in it, 
each kid takes off their hat and puts it in the hole, nobody loses their hats, no more time wasted. Another big element of Lancasterian schooling was that children weren't supposed to be beaten anymore. No corporal punishment. Instead, Lancaster advocated, it sounds harsh, but uh, uh, he, he, was, he argued for this as a, as a, a humane um, reform. Kids were supposed to be publicly humiliated instead of beaten. So if someone did something wrong, you put a dunce cap on them and put them in a corner. If someone did something wrong, you put a, a log around their neck or shackles on their ankles. The most famous, and he ditched, Lancaster himself ditched this after 1817. The most famous was the basket or the bird cage. And as you can see here, occasionally boys are put in a sack or in a basket suspended to the roof of the school in sight of all the pupils who frequently smile at the birds in the cage. This punishment is one of the most terrible that can be inflicted on boys of sense and abilities. Well, sure, uh, but Lancaster wasn't um, trying to be uh, harsh. He was trying to uh, undo the traditional corporal punishments and instead work in uh, rewards and humiliating punishments. And so the promise, which may seem um, obviously faulty uh, in hindsight, was that he, using these school methods, without spending any more money, cities like Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, Savannah, Georgia, um, they could educate all the kids, all the low-income kids, uh, without having them spend any more money. And then so instead of turning them into thieves and prostitutes, their education would turn them into, you know, virtuous, law-abiding citizens. Um, and some of the problems are baked into the system itself, but some of them came from Lancaster. So for example, Lancaster had a terrible time with money. From the get-go in 19, uh, sorry, 1798, when he's a young person and he's suddenly famous, rocketed to company with kings and dukes, he starts traveling around the UK making lectures about his system of education. And they're very popular. And so uh, he has a flair for the dramatic and he keeps asking for money, uh, donations, but also loans. So he gets loans to build a schoolhouse in Borough Road in London. He gets money to buy a printing press and he's cranking out his, his manuals, his guidebooks. Uh, but he also just takes a lot of donations and puts them in a pocket and he doesn't keep receipts of any of this stuff. And maybe worst of all, he's a public figure driving around London in these expensive rented coaches with four horses and a, a bunch of low income kids, you know, jumping on board and He's a, a celebrity burning through this money in the name of the poor, but it doesn't look good. And by 1808, he had run out of excuses and, and dodges. He had, so, he had so much debt that his creditors were threatening to take over the school that he had built. So a group of sympathizers sat him down. I mean, we'd call it an intervention. They sat him down and they said, this has to stop. You can't keep doing this. And they work out a deal, it's very bitter, but they work out a deal. It turns out, they, or they make him show whatever paperwork he had. And so this is 1808, he had no idea, but it turns out he's 6,500 pounds in debt, 6,500 pounds, which um, is a rough translation. A, a very successful school uh, teacher could maybe make somewhere between 300 to maybe 500 pounds a year. So roughly, you've got this 25-year-old who owes somewhere about, you know, three quarters of a million dollars or a million dollars to a variety of uh, people around London, and he has no income, no way to pay any of it back, and he doesn't even know how much he owes. So the supporters say, look it, okay, we'll pay all that debt. You get a, a clean slate. You, Lancaster, you have to stop asking for money and then taking it and just spending it. And we'll give you a salary. You run the school in London, train teachers, you know, keep your system going because we like your system, but you have to agree to these rules. And Lancaster bitterly and angrily says, okay, but then he just won't do it. He keeps going around asking for money, taking money, spending money, uh, borrowing money. Um, and it, it, it gets so extreme that one of his supporters, he doesn't really have friends anymore. 
One of his supporters later in his memoir writes this about Joseph Lancaster. Uh, uh, Joseph Hume writes, uh, uh, Lancaster's behavior had in so many, in, in many inter instances been so extraordinary that I begin to suspect the soundness of his intellects. Uh, and that's a, a relatively kind, you know, 19th century um, rhetoric for the way Lancaster had burned all his bridges with supporters uh, and backers in London. And it's in this environment that DeWitt Clinton in, in New York and people like Roberts Vox, who was a, a, a world, uh, sorry, a city leader in Philadelphia, invite Lancaster to the United States. This is the time when Pennsylvania passes a law creating a school district in Philadelphia and mandating that the schools be run on Lancaster's principles. So the system is very famous and still very popular in the, in the United States, even though Lancaster's reputation in London had really tarnished uh, the reputation of the, the system in, in London. Um, so Lancaster jumps at the chance and he comes across to New York. Uh, unfortunately, neither the system nor Lancaster worked any better in the United States than they had in, in the UK. Let me just give you a couple of examples. So for example, New York, um, they have a, a, a school for African-American students. They called it the African Free School. And it's run on uh, the principles of Lancasterian education. And parents uh, revolt, at the, at, especially at one of the punishments that Lancaster had advocated. Uh, you might remember, no more corporal punishment, but public humiliations, including the one that uh, rubbed uh, New York's um, African-American community wrong, was having their children shackled ankle to ankle and paraded backwards around the schoolroom uh, while other people said what they had done wrong. Uh, you know, in the American context, there is no, you know, there, there, there's no way any African-American parent or sensitive non-African-American person is gonna want to see kids, any kids, but certainly African-American kids shackled together by the ankles. And so, and this is one of Lancaster's scandals. Instead of saying, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, that's so insensitive, I didn't realize, he flies off the handle and he says, I'm a Quaker, how can you accuse me of being insensitive? I'm more sensitive about you know, racial injustice than any of you African-American parents and makes the situation worse. But that meant that parents stopped going to the Lancasterian school. So in 1827, for example, that's the only survey data we have or that I can find, there were an estimated 2,500 African-American kids in New York that were eligible to go to this school, but only 600 were attending. 600 were registered, even fewer attended. It just was very unpopular. Similarly, in the United States, these Lancasterian schools were very unpopular with teachers. So, um, for example, if you were a teacher and you could be 14, 15 years old, if you had some experience teaching in a Lancasterian school as a monitor, you could get a job at a different school as a teacher and get paid. Or, you could stay at the Lancastrian school and teach for free. So obviously, a lot of these teachers, as soon as they were offered another job, and it wasn't unusual for 14 or 15 year olds to be offered jobs as paid teachers in schools, not just in New York City, but around um, uh, the country and the towns uh, and city, they left and they took these jobs. The apprentice system was breaking down at the time and New York school leaders tried to impose an apprenticeship on these um, teachers to make it legally impossible for them to leave before they were 21. But it, it, it had no teeth by that time. By the 18 teens, um, apprenticeship has sort of become uh, fallen out of fashion. And, and teach, young people refused to work for nothing when they could work for something, which again seems so obvious in, in hindsight. Um, so, the big question that this brings us to, so why, if Lancaster's system fell apart so fast, why do we even care? Why isn't this just a sort of story of what, you know, curious story of one, you know, unpleasant man and um, his ideas that didn't work? And here's, here's the argument that I'm working on. The reason we should care about Lancaster, well, for one, it, he's just a very interesting and terrible person. Um, I haven't even gotten to the way he 
abused his, his daughter and his wife. It's just ugly. He wasn't, I started this research thinking he was a sort of well-meaning but naive reformer. He was a monster. But that aside, uh, his, his story matters because of things like this. Uh, this is the model school that Philadelphia uh, built. The first school district in Pennsylvania was in Philadelphia in its region. And in 1818, Pennsylvania passed a law saying, all right, Philadelphia is gonna have a school district. It's gonna have schools run on the Lancasterian plan. And so in 1818, one of the things they did was they built this building. Now this photo is from uh, the early 1900s. The building's no longer there. If you know Philadelphia, it's sort of up by the um, touristy like public market area now. Um, but this building was built in 1890, sorry, 1818 because of Pennsylvania's new law that mandated Lancasterian schools, this building was made to Lancaster's specifications and it cost a lot of money. The, the lot cost $8,000, the building cost $6,239.05, and the furniture cost $861.96. And obviously the details don't matter. It's the amount of money that Pennsylvania and Philadelphia invested in Lancasterian schools that matters. The system didn't work and Lancaster was a horrible person. But Philadelphia is stuck with this building and these schools. Uh, eventually, when they moved away from Lancasterian schools, or, uh, so for example, in 1837, they remodeled that same building and they put it in classrooms because parents wanted teachers, not children. Uh, not monitors. So uh, the first school district of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia put in classrooms into that same building. But that cost them $10,074.03. And so for years and years, the leaders of Philadelphia school district tried to make the Lancasterian system work because they had invested in it, both sort of politically and actually financially with buildings and things like that. So it's because of this investment that Lancaster matters uh, as, as more than just an interesting story. His ideas shaped the first generation of public schools in the United States, in, in the big cities at least. Um, it was solving the problems that showed up that created public schools the way we know them. So for example, when the parents of the New York uh, African Free School complained about the punishments, um, the school leaders worked to replace those punishments and the way the school was organized with things that are more recognizably um, you know, the way a modern school system works. So for example, the New York African Free School eventually um, became folded into what was called the public school system instead of the free school system. It became a school more open to uh, parental feedback, including um, things like uh, uh, the administration, tax funding, that kind of thing. Uh, in Pennsylvania and in New York, but uh, especially in Pennsylvania, when the large Lancastrian schoolroom doesn't work, they eventually move to what we think of as, as a, a, a modern public school with classrooms, age grade, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, as a solution to the problems of the Lancastrian system. So what about the man himself? Uh, his end wasn't pretty, and I'm, I'm almost done. I, I always tend to talk too long when I start talking about Lancaster. Um, but his, his ending wasn't, wasn't pretty. It didn't work, and Lancaster created this perfect problem for himself. If his system did work, for example, if, in other words, um, school districts could run uh, without any, you know, um, specialized teacher with the, the monitors teaching other groups of children. If the system was as perfect as Lancaster said, then cities didn't need him. On the other hand, if the system didn't work, well then the system didn't need, uh, the cities didn't need him either. So Lancaster inadvertently created this impossible situation for himself. Plus, he really believed his whole life, and his, his letters to his daughter are just um, heartbreaking for the daughter because he kept promising this big score. He sounds like a gambler. He's like, at some point he's like, okay, Philadelphia didn't work out, Liza, but Boston, I'm gonna go to Boston, I'm gonna make six grand and we're gonna get a little house in the country, it's gonna be great. Doesn't work out. But in 1826, 
Uh, Simon Bolivar, the, the famous um, liberator of South America, who had just kicked the Spanish out of um, Gran Colombia, that what's now like Venezuela and, and that area of South America. Simon Bolivar had a new government and he invited Joseph Lancaster in 1826 to come down to Caracas and install Lancasterian schools. And so Lancaster had been in flight from New York to Philadelphia to Baltimore to Boston, always creditors catching up with him. So he gets this letter and says, Caracas, uh, Bol General Bolivar promised him 10,000 American dollars to do this. And this was Lancaster's dream, finally his big score. So he moves down to Caracas, and this is about the saddest thing I've ever seen in any archive. Um, every day, Lancaster is writing, first of all, this is his not very impressive uh, letterhead that he gets while he's in, in um, Caracas. Uh, and every day, he writes, uh, Lancaster writes to Bolivar's office, where's the money? Uh, could I get the money? Um, my agent in London says, they haven't seen any money. Where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> and and the Bolivar's office just keeps putting them off, putting them off, putting them off. Uh, to my mind, I don't know if any, there's any Veep fans, but in the early seasons, when she's vice president, she keeps coming into the office and always asking, did the president call? Did the president call? Did the president call? Never. And so Lancaster eventually gives up. No money. He moves back from Caracas to Montreal. And by the late 1830s, Lancaster's living penniless in Montreal, claiming that he had invented a new improved system for public schools, but that he wouldn't tell anybody what it was unless they paid him first, because he was claiming that he had been ripped off so badly. But by then, no one cared. Uh, cities like uh, New York and Philadelphia had moved away from a Lancasterian school system by the late 1830s into a system the way we think of schools now, where one teacher has a group of students that are about the same age, um, where uh, you have, instead of um, a, a collection of philanthropy and, and subscriptions to pay for schools, you have tax funding, you have elected school boards, those kinds of things by 1830s in the bigger cities had become the norm. They had only become the norm though, because the Lancaster's promises had failed so badly but the cities had already been co uh, committed themselves to having schools for all. So when uh, Lancaster finally gets killed in 1838 in New York, Lancasterianism is over. Um, Lancaster himself had become a sort of sad, um, you know, a memory of the early 1800s. And I do believe that uh, there, that he was, he thought he was going to be the Erie Canal of public schools. Uh, but he wasn't. And the line that I'm working on, they thought he and he and his allies thought they were digging the equivalent of an Erie Canal, but they weren't. What they were doing and unintentionally was just digging under the foundation, so to speak, of the old patchwork system of schools, private, public, all these mixed kind of schools. And what they what they what by accident, they made that kind of system no longer functional and reformers had to fix them. And in doing so, they created what we think of as our modern public schools. So uh, thank you, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking. I know we've only got a couple of people in the Zoom audience, but I don't know if there's questions or comments. I'd love to hear. Yeah, we've, we've had a decent crowd here on uh, Facebook Live, so I encourage you folks to uh, ask questions too. Oh, I forgot, uh, this is, why you folks paid the big bucks to be on the Zoom call. You're unmuted now. You mean, oh, no, oh, I meant I accidentally muted everyone. I meant to say unmute everyone. You can all speak now if you'd like. Um, or in the chat, uh, you know, ask some questions if you'd like. Uh, I, I was wondering uh, when Bolivar asked him to come to Gran Colombia, did he even speak Spanish? <laughs> uh, no. And he didn't okay. see that to be a problem. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 I wish, I, I started thinking that I was going to write this book as a sort of global history of this movement, because it really was global. Um, all across Europe, all across India, um, all across uh, the, where, where colonial presence was strong in Africa, and then eventually all across um, Latin America, 
Lancasterian education becomes very uh, popular, um, including Lancaster's daughter eventually opens a school with her husband in Mexico City that's very successful. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, he, uh, Lancaster, his, his attitude about the trip to Caracas was so purely venal. He just saw the $10,000 and said, yes, I can solve all your problems. Give me the money. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That seems like it would be important for teaching in South America. Um, someone asked in Facebook, um, she missed the beginning. Uh, how did Joseph Lancaster die? Oh, it was gruesome. I, 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 this is a, I'll never know, but I think he jumped in front. Of, I, I think he stepped intentionally in front of this horse carriage. What we do know is that his head was crushed by a horse carriage in New York in 1838. Um, we don't know exactly what he was thinking, but um, things were very gloomy for him, and he had long been subject to fits of depression and his supporters worried that he might harm himself for always. So who knows? It sounds a little like it. Um, someone's asking, um, so you mentioned this whole kind of apprenticeship uh, deal. Um, does that have any relationship at all, you know, to uh, student teaching? <laughs> <laughs> having having uh, gone through it, I could see some parallels. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, I, the, the um, the, the, the hugest difference, and I do think it's a significant difference, is that in 1818, for example, when the trustees of the New York free school system talked about possibly having an apprentice system, um, they were, were living in a very different world from us. Uh, I mean, when it comes to apprenticeship, the apprentice system, and it didn't, it didn't stop at a certain time. It sort of in the United States, it never was as solid as it had been in Europe. And it died a sort of lingering death in the United States. So for example, famously, people like um, Ben Franklin, you know, Ben Franklin was apprenticed a couple of places, but eventually to his older brother as a printer. Um, and the apprentice system mixed, um, you know, you're supposed to live in the household of, of your, and, and the word was master. Uh, you had no, um, you were, you, were, you were bound to service, like you didn't have legal rights. You couldn't just leave. Once you were, the, the contract, and the, the contracts were indented on the sides, that's where the indented, indentured servitude language comes from. Once a contract was signed, usually by a parent and then some sort of, you know, tradesperson, the children were bound by it. They couldn't leave. Uh, by 1818 in New York, only by practical, impossibilities was the system sort of broken down. Uh, in New York, these teachers just left. These, and they were 14, 15, 13 years old. They left and the, the school couldn't do anything about it. So they said, hey, can we legally enforce that these kids have to stay here? Uh, student teaching, of course, it is a kind of apprenticeship these days, uh, but it's very different. It's adults, you know, your parents don't sign you up to be a teacher when you're 12 and you have to do it till you're 21. Um, but certainly <laughs> student teachers are teaching without getting paid. And, uh, you know, I think the best, ref one of the best reforms these days on the table is a new look at that, you know, a paid year long um, new teacher thing where you're, you know, you're actually paid to be a new teacher and you're given a lot of mentoring would make a lot of sense. But certainly it's a form of apprenticeship, but the world that we live in apprentice wise is totally different. That makes sense. Interesting, that new idea. Um, not seeing any more questions on Facebook. Uh, I have a question. I, yes. This is, it's almost completely unrelated and very big, but I, I kind of wonder from your, your research and, and what you've learned about education systems of the past, um, if you have any insight or comments on the education, education system at present or anything that we can learn from the past as we kind of venture into this like brand new world of, of education. Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, thanks, uh, Natalie. I, one of the things that jumps out at you from um, 200 years ago uh, is how um, unchanged or, or um, durable, I guess is a better word, Americans, and not just Americans, but a lot of people have this 
really strong assumption that uh, technological changes will dictate like vast educational changes and the reality just doesn't keep up. So for example, in Lancaster's time, uh, people like DeWitt Clinton, uh, Roberts Vox in, in uh, uh, Philadelphia, they were uh, geared to thinking that the world was different now because of the changes that had happened in technology at the time, which were, which were significant. Were, things were really changing 200 years ago as, you know, uh, in terms of how cities were organized, how factories were organized, how uh, freight could be transported. Those were significant um, real changes. Uh, and the people at the time just assumed the same thing could be done of teaching. And Lancaster, he was, he, he was sincere about that. He really thought he had solved all the problems of, of education using technology. Um, he thought he could transmit information into thousands of people without costing any more money using architecture, using you know, pretty simple technologies like sand tables and slates. These days, and I'm a, I'm a technophile as a teacher. I, uh, the three of us were talking a little before. As a middle school teacher, I love classroom technology. It's great. I taught history. And, you know, when I went to school, a teacher couldn't take a question about, well, what did a trireme look like, unexpected, and then just, you know, Google it and put a picture of a trireme up on the board. That's awesome. That's huge. And now we're just used to that. Like, it's just, well, yeah, you just, that's just the internet, of course. But that's awesome. Um, I think the dangers, especially with the pandemic, come when people assume too blithely that the nature of education, or sorry, the intractable sort of social problems that get represented in schools and in education can be, have a simple solution through technology. So for example, um, during the pandemic, it, when lower income people have no internet at home, or let alone in our area, no electricity at home sometimes. Um, the, I think that really shows up the, the, the blatant uh, problems with assuming that we can just internet our way through uh, homeschooling. Well, uh, that, that I think sounds like a, a good, good point to, to close on. Uh, thanks everybody for, uh, for coming out to watch. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, I believe this will still be available on our Facebook page to watch in the future. So, uh, also probably on our YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Jerry and Zach. Thanks for showing up. Uh, it's nice to see you. And I see you too. Yep. See thanks you. so much, Adam. My pleasure. Talk to you. Bye bye. Bye.